<clears throat> morning, morning. So today you'll notice it's all a bit different and uh, that's because I was getting really annoyed with that little enclosed circle format that we had but I didn't want to show the rest of the lounge in case people had to walk past or anything like that. So today we're going to talk about daybreakers. Um, so as I mentioned yesterday, uh, post Comic Con recovery, so I did a lot of stock take, visiting the bank, um, sorting out a little bits of business stuff. But in between all this, I had a whole bunch of time to watch stuff. And so I, I binged uh, Daybreakers on Netflix. And um, I'll mention when we sort of cut into the spoiler discussion, so at the start it'll be spoiler free. But I finished it, and I had a really good time with it. It's this... Um, so not going off their definitions or definitions I've seen online, I'd call it a um, happy-go-lucky teen drama in the post-apocalypse, right? It's more about the drama of high school interpersonal relationships than it is about the apocalypse, though the apocalypse storyline is pretty good. And the thing that got me hooked straight off the bat, other than the fourth wall breaking narration, is the um, sort of pencil line drawing style on top. I'm, I've got a huge soft spot for that. You would have seen it in um, my Unity tutorials, and I keep on meaning to go back to Blender 2.8 and sit down and do a bunch of tutorials to just see how the grease pencils evolved, because I know they've done a bunch of stuff with that. So um, off the bat, the show had a lot of like karmic joy for me just to enjoy, and I was you know, recovering and doing busy work, so having something sort of peppy and upbeat was, was super interesting. I think the thing that amused me most, though, is um, if you if you work in creative spaces, and especially if you work with publishers and contract signing and whatnot, you realize that a lot of um, what gets picked up and what doesn't get picked up is based on market research trends. And the funny thing is, is there's not many companies doing this kind of market research. So everyone's kind of reading the same research. Um, it's, it's somewhat hilarious, actually. So what will happen is um, a company will go out, they'll do this huge survey that's cost a lot of money um, on what's popular with what demographic and what's hip and what's coming and what's the trend. And then they'll, um, they'll sell this report. They'll usually have um, sort of three tiers of this report or four tiers really. They'll have a press release that they sort of send out everywhere and you might see one or two trade journals or things like that pick it up. They'll have a slightly meatier document which some journalists will scrape and read for their articles but a lot won't. A lot of them just, just repurpose the press release. They'll have the paid for report and then they'll have the more sort of complete um, uh, unredacted if you will like with all the data and numbers report so <laughs> yeah no it's a bit of a mess um so yeah they'll they'll do these these style of reports and then um, because everyone uh, because it's such an expensive report a few people will um, pay for this um, and some companies um, like Sony's one of them will have subscriptions to these services and so if you're working in one of these departments, you read these reports, you get executive summaries of these reports. These reports are sort of um, fuel in the corporate machine. You know, lots of people regurgitate them. You'll start hearing them in conversations and da, 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 da. And because of this, we have these sort of waves in the creative industry. And this is not a new phenomenon. This has been around since, I'd say, the early 80s. Um but it's a lot more obvious now just because of how the internet works. So Daybreakers is of this post-apocalypse teen genre. And you go like, well, Claire, you know, how many of these things have there been? Well, if you keep your eye out, you'll actually see a lot of them, but most of them won't be successful. So you'll th see games like Rad that have come out. You'll see Daybreakers. Uh, Netflix also has an original cartoon show with a very, very similar presence. Um... I'm trying to remember the name of it. Oh, I can't recall. But there's a whole bunch of them sort of dotted around. And if you actually go out and you look for novels that have been commissioned and published, um, comics, games, movies, you'll find a whole sort of sway. This is like Daybreak is a sort of teen post-apocalypse, you know, Boppy is sort of off the moment. 
And it makes sense, right, with all the climate change stuff, with all the politics stuff and whatnot. It it clearly knows what it wants to do. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's fun from that point of view, but you also start to see a lot of the tropes. But, you know, then as the show itself says, you know, um, tropes are tropes for a reason, like cliches are a reason because they're true. So, mm, Daybreakers was good fun. Ooh, this is still hot. Um, and it reminds me, actually, Harry Potter suffered a very similar thing. If you go back to when Harry Potter was first released. Now, first of all, don't buy the Harry Potter story um, of her being broke and all that stuff. Read the wider context and you'll be like, oh, right, of course, uh, Oxford educated. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of hilarious how much of a sort of PR story it is. But what you'll notice is around that time, there were a lot of um, wizard uh, or magic school books going on. And I know this because there was one in particular about a necromancer school that I really enjoyed, um, that I couldn't find, and I went on a hunt for it, because it was published uh, a year or two before Harry Potter. And, oh my God, the amount of just similar books I found in the genre was, was scary high, super scary high. Um because all the publishers were sort of rolling out and they all wanted that genre. So anyway, pump, uh, Poppy Teen Apocalypse, you're going to see a lot of it. You're going to see a lot of um, kind of in the Pineapple Express vein, but it's going to be aimed towards the, the demo is going to be lower because um, it's going to be a lot of um, sort of teen frustration at adult lifestyle choices. Um and, you know, they've got a season two, apparently already confirmed and renewed, which is good. And um, so let's, let, let's talk about the premise before we actually go into spoilers. So the basic premise is um, there is this Canadian misfit character in high school. You know, a lot of the tropes, new to school, no friends. Um, the character doesn't well define any strong opinions early in the show because the character is meant to be sort of a projection for the audience to sort of fill themselves into, hence the outcast misfit trope. Um, it's somewhat hilarious because um, as the show self-identifies, historically a shorthand for this was a lot of um, music and um, media that was identified with outcast, and unfortunately that is mainstream now, and so you can no longer use that as shorthand. The skateboarding, though, the skateboarding is still shorthand for um, high school mif- misfit, three f- free-thinking individual, which is kind of hilarious because that trope has survived a long time. And I'd argue if you really want to be free-thinking, fucking rollerblades, man, rollerblades. So, yeah. Mm. But so they've got this this character... The apocalypse is happening. The character's doing very well. The show starts off very happy-go-lucky. And this is to sort of set the tone for you to differentiate from um, societal collapse porn. This is not reveling in the societal collapse. This is not about the the zombies or the ghoulies, as they call them. This is not um, a harrowing show of survival. They're very clear to set the tone off the bat. Um one of my favorite scenes in the first episode that does this is the mutated pug scene. There is this this pug that um, has been mutated by the radiation, and it's this beast. It's this, like, violent, huge beast, but it's still a fucking pug, so it's digging around in garbage and destroyed stuff, but it's now just on an epic, you know, post-apocalyptic scale. And that sort of sets the tone. That and, like, the, the spider-eyed squirrels and everything... Um, you know, it's it's amusing. So anyway, they set up this tone, um, and then the they have a confrontation with some golfers in um, in the church, and this is to sort of set the stage of tribal conflict and set up some running gags, which are very rewarding with the golf team. Um, and he thinks he's rescuing the love of his life, which of course he you know discovered just before the apocalypse. Um, but it's actually this really bratty, uh, uh, how does she self-describe? A, geni- a genius with flex- flexible morals. Um, and she's 
um, well, A, she's young to sort of spread the demo. B, she's young to remove any chance that she'll be in any kind of sexual triangle. You know, you don't want it. This character's not meant to confuse the love relationship. But then um, her being bratty and smart, like she is very well crafted for her demo. Um, it's really interesting to see her addition. And she's a good character. She adds a, a lot of interesting mix. She's psychically psychotic and um, she gives the writers a lot of um, outlets for a lot of humor and setup lines. So rescues her and as part of rescuing her very quickly discovers the, the third main character which is this um, ex-jock black gay samurai, well I'm sorry ronin but street samurai style character who is trying to redeem himself. And again this is reinforcing the tone of if you can squirm that sentence into your brain you will either love it or hate it. It's very appealing to me so I loved it straight off the bat but um and this is a sort of third character again um, he covers a lot of intersectionalities for the audience um, you know being cynical sort of creative producer on the head kind of thing you know like why is this character here it's like okay well this broadens them out oh and he's a weed smoker as well so um, this is sort of a, a catch-all tokenizing character in many ways um, but it gives them it gives again the writers a different avenue to approach this from and so with this triumphant setup um, they're now off to save Sam Dean the love interest and if you're a supernatural fan and you know about Sam and Dean slash Vic you realize the writers totally know their audience and they're just throwing them a bone which is hilarious um, and yeah, so I would, I would say I don't think there's much productive spoiler-free conversation past that other than the show does a lot of tribal stuff. It does a lot of um, it does a lot of really interesting, as I say, it's a high school drama more than it is post-apocalypse, right? It's um, mm, it's yeah, it's more about the the enemies are other kids um but it's also very strong uh it's also really strong at setting up <laughs> my name's claire if that helps at all for you um uh the it, it's also very good at setting up the um i mean it's it's so hilariously retro you know in the sense of um, we've seen a lot of these sort of high school tribal jokes going back to the Warriors, going back to um, a lot of 80s high school drama, right? This, even though the show is so modern in its take, it's so retro at the same time. It's, it's, um, it's very tropey, it's very comfortable with its tropes. Like, it, it's in no way, um, how do I put this? The writers know that they're leaning into these really easy gags, but they're still fucking funny. And if you, as a teen watching this who hasn't seen The Warriors, hasn't seen Heathers, hasn't seen a lot of the sort of classics there, and you're just coming to it with fresh eyes, you'll just be amused. And um, I think a lot of older people watching this might get some serious cringe moments. To be honest, I think some younger people will as well. Um, but for other people, those cringe moments will really land. And as long as they keep the balance right, your cringe moments disappear in your laughter. So um, there's one or two Fortnite jokes, which I'm betting... See... I'm, I'm curious because product placement is always a funny thing. Netflix is really good at product placement, but I don't think the Fortnite stuff is product placement. It might be, but I think it's just let's take advantage of the um, the cultural now and like it's an easy gag. So yeah, I think I think the Fortnite stuff is is just the writers leaning into an easy gag. Um, that all being said, I think. Uh, the really fun stuff is to talk about the spoilery conversation, so I'm just going to sort of wave my hand here to indicate spoiler has commenced. 
and we'll go into the the spoilerific chat. Hmm, oh, that's good. So it's um, I want to say ten episodes. I think it's ten episodes. Yeah, ten episodes. Um, ten episodes, and um, interestingly, not all the main, not all the episodes focus on the main character Josh Wheeler. Um, a lot of the episodes actually, and this is why I say I want to go into spoiler discussion because while you could talk about these characters and generalities. I don't think it's as interesting, and I think the more you discuss them, the less you'll enjoy the show prior to watching it, because a lot of the show is about the discovery. So one of the big takeaways is early in the show, they shift away, and they're like, oh shit, um, this is not going to be just Joss's fourth, fourth wall narration breaking stuff. It's also going to be um, Angelica's, it's also going to be um, Wesley's, and a whole bunch of other characters will get their their moment to shine basically but it also lets the show play around with tone like so when wesley's episode happens um they get uh, one of the wu-tang clan to do the narration they um go with a lot of um eastern tropes in there because of the whole samurai thing but then you know they're not naive when they do this the writers are very aware like they they actively insert lines about why black culture has embraced um a lot of anime and a lot of kung fu films and stuff like that so it's interesting um so they, they do play with that and the angelica one i mean the angelica one's a bit on the nose i feel um it it feels a bit easy but given the target audience for like who Angelica appeals to I think it'll I think it lands pretty well um there's there's so many things you could nitpick with the show that I don't think are helpful because it's so much fun like we get an episode where there's a bunch of gamers holed up in a truck with solar panels playing um video games online against other people in the world right and immediately you could go well the solar solar power usage is blah and how much does all this stuff take and satellites you know aren't just satellites they operate with ground-based stuff and there's a whole bunch of you could go you like there's so much stuff like that if you if you're serious about this as a post-apocalyptic genre you will not you'll you'll miss the point you'll miss the fun um so it's it's always important to like have that constant reminder um in terms of character arcs this is i think one of the things i like the best about the show every character has an arc and develops um they all have their own motivations and um, the writers have set them up pretty well uh i think anyone who watches the show and likes the character eli will be really (sighs) so um, again, we're in the spoiler part of the discussion, so bear that in mind. But Eli, Eli gets a, a Josh Whedon moment. And I totally understand why, but I also think it's really cheap. Like, so they clearly had this actor on contract for this season or whatever. Like, they didn't want to carry him over to next season. Also, this particular character, it's one of the side characters. And he's very much there to be a foil, an annoyance. Um, he starts out as a pseudo enemy, quickly becomes, you know, part of the part of the gang, but through a sort of friction-based relationship. And you know, he has a reason, he has a purpose. Again, he's representative of a group. But once his arc has concluded, and once he gets the super sweet moments on the way to um, the high school. It's not much. I think the writers felt like they could. Um, I don't feel like there's much the writers could have done with that character. I felt like that character had been extended out. Um, they could have potentially played with Eli some more, but I understand why they basically Josh Weed and Eden uh, Eli, but. It also didn't feel, it felt like his death was just abrupt and didn't even serve as a point of character development for Josh, right? Because if you're going to, so for example, um, 
when Whedon has typically killed off characters that abruptly, he has done it as just a plot stick moment, you know, to sort of push things um, forward, right? Um, he basically is like, I'm going to burn this character card and I'm going to exchange it for plot points so I can push the plot abruptly in a direction. Obviously, the first example of that being um, in Buffy when he was like, Oh, right, I really want Willow to go off the hill, so gunshot through window. Very, very abrupt. And, you know, um, but, you know, this felt more like Wash's death, where it was just like, this character's no longer convenient to our writing. Um, we're just going to write this character out. Um, so that, that that's more... Uh, that that's more what it felt like. Mm, yeah, the Buffy season one finale death felt more... It felt more interesting for other reasons. I, I think the window death is more um, egregious. But yeah, Eli's death is... Um, I mean, because we're in spoiler spoiler chat, the pug that was set up in season in episode one literally comes back. There's a random encounter with um, one of the characters that has been freed, and you've totally forgotten about him. He's He's gone off, he's run off, and you haven't seen this character for five episodes, maybe four episodes. And this character comes, runs in, stabs Eli in a point of confusion, thinking he's another character, and then runs off, and he gets eaten by a pug. The entire moment is self-contained within two minutes kind of thing, um, and then he bleeds to death in Josh's arms, and it's just like, hmm. It's definitely my biggest gripe with the show. Moving on to more positive stuff, because I do need to wrap up and get to work um, soonish. Moving on to more po positive stuff. The show really delivers with the season finale. I feel it would have been a much more interesting and better show if they just wrapped it up in a single season. I feel like the show, if it was based on a book, or if it was a book, or if it was a comic, um, I feel it would be a standalone thing, where it would have ended... Boom, done um and it would it would have been a great self-contained piece of work um they they extended out some plot lines they did a very nice bait and switch with the romantic interest at the end of the the season which i think really helped because um something they were very good at is establishing sam dean as um Oh, this this sticker here. This sticker is from um, this sticker is from Tokyo. Um, it's a little shop called B Side Label. But yeah, so um, at the end of it all, they did um, they did wrap it up really nicely. I feel like the love interest was never a damsel. Um, she was really interesting. The hero was taken off his peg in one of the last episodes where they flash back they reveal actually the hero is not as great as you think um yeah i feel like a lot of i think wesley honestly wesley is such a solid character his whole thing with turbo is just so great um all in all it's just such a solid show it's a hearty recommend and uh yeah, it's one of those that I think I, I actually look forward to season two. I wish they had sort of made it a single season thing. Um, I'm concerned that season two will lack because the characters have had such a satisfying character arc. It doesn't feel like there is... It feels like they'll have to invent new things for the characters to do rather than there is things in progress to pick up on. Um I'm not interested in the mystery of why the nukes fell. I'm not interested in the mystery of um, the various... Like, they set up in the last few episodes a few mysteries around the nukes and the ghoulies and things like that. Doesn't it all interest me because the show at its core is a teen drama and, and a lot of the teen drama stuff has resolved? So we'll see how Daybreakers does for season two. I'm very skeptical season two will be very good. But that all said highly highly recommend season one it's definitely worth the time and um with that we will end that